Hey, superstars. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Aaron Zakowski, and today I'm chatting with Jeremiah Smith. Jeremiah is the founder and CEO of Simple Tiger, a SaaS-focused SEO and content marketing agency based in Florida. Jeremiah has over 14 years of SEO experience, helping brands like E-Trade, Audible, Mint, and many smaller startups to grow their customer base and MRR. Hey, Jeremiah, how's it going today? Good. How about you? Doing great. Excited to have you on the show. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. For sure. Uh, so basically, just to kick things off, tell us a little bit more about yourself and about your agency and what you do. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, so I've been in SEO for about 14 years now and um, started Simple Tiger right there at the beginning doing consulting and uh, you know working with some smaller mom and pop shops and stuff like that before I eventually discovered uh, you know focusing in on a, on a target niche and, and work with a target audience and kind of developing out from there. Um, in my experience kind of growing the, the agency, you know, of course it started with just me, so I wouldn't really call it an agency back then. Uh, but in my experience doing that, I went on and worked with a couple of other agencies uh, as I was kind of learning how it works and everything. And so that's how I got some exposure to some larger brands. And I got to see how, how big companies, you know, big fortune 500s do SEO and everything like that. And so I kind of brought that back to, to what I was applying for the companies I was working with and eventually just decided to grow, focus on growing my own, my own agency. Um, after a little while decided, you know what, I need to focus on a certain target audience and just kind of go after them. And that's, that's kind of how, uh, that's kind of how the focus on SaaS companies began. Uh, so, so why SaaS? You were picking a niche. Why, why did it end up being SaaS? Yeah. So uh, I actually am a big fan of Peter Drucker and in his kind of breakdown of how to, how to figure out where your strengths are as a business. One thing I found in some of his writings were using the 80, 20 principle to look at where most of your, most of your income is coming from for a business. Most of your happiness is coming from within your business. Um, the stuff that you find that's the easiest or most enjoyable to work on, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so I started applying this 80-20 principle to our clientele and looking at, all right, we work with e-commerce, we work with publishers, we work with local businesses, we work with SaaS businesses. We had all these different types of clientele. We were doing basically SEO for anybody. And uh, after doing that kind of analysis, I noticed that about 50% of our clients, though, were SaaS companies. The rest were all uh, those other types. And so then I started analyzing those SaaS companies. I was like, well, that's a nice majority there. What do their case studies look like? What do the results look like for them? And I was like, oh, wow, those are like where most of our case studies are. And then I started thinking about who do I enjoy getting on calls with the most? And it turned out to be all these SaaS companies. And so I was like, all right, you know what? This is, this is a pattern. So we should probably focus in on that. Um, also, we were doing things for SaaS companies that were highly specialized to them that we couldn't apply to like an e-commerce company, for example. So, you know, this, uh, a typical B2B SaaS company has like, uh, you know, they'll, they'll use the term either software or platform or tool or, you know, system, something along those lines. Like those are just some keyword angles that right out of the gate, we already knew. And we were doing that for SaaS companies that may previously have been thinking of themselves as an app, you know, but they weren't using the word software or platform or tool, which their searchers are actually using. So, that was one angle that helped us steer our solution in that direction. And then a whole lot of other stuff when it came down to like content strategy and things like that, how you structure content on your site, what the content is, um, what, what types of content you need, how it flows, uh, you know, are you appealing to, are you applying too much around features and not enough around use cases or, um, or benefits and solutions and things like that. And so, that's where we really got hyper specific. And then we also developed some relationships in the community in regards to SaaS. So when it came down to time to do link building for our clients, we had great relationships set up with publishers and, and, and blogs and different media publications that were willing to link to our SaaS clients. And there's a lot of news happening in that space all the time. So there's a lot of content out there uh, willing to link to, you know, hot hot news stories, hot resources, and things like that. So we kind of put all that together and just focused our focused our niche down on SaaS companies. Nice. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so visiting your website earlier this week, you know, I saw you guys have a, a SaaS SEO framework that you promote to your clients and to, to your, your leads coming through. Um, tell us a little bit about your your, your framework and, and, and how you do SaaS kind of specific for, so SEO specific for the SaaS industry. 
Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I like to think in terms of frameworks, I think it just helps me kind of organize everything, all the little pieces um, into, you know, nice categories so that you can kind of start breaking them down. You know, you take this big complex thing like SEO for a company and you have to break it down into manageable chunks. And then you take those manageable chunks and you break them down further into tasks and then you implement those tasks. And a strategy should dictate a lot of what goes into that framework. Well, um, this SEO framework actually could apply generally across just about any type of company almost. Um, but our specific SaaS SEO framework, as you read into it, you'll see that it gets much more detailed and focuses just into the SaaS community. And so uh, the, the framework is really a four-part framework. I really see SEO as being made up of four different categories of activities. There's keyword research, then there's technical, then there's content. And then there's offsite and offsite is really just link building when we're talking about SaaS companies. Um, if you're talking about local businesses, they have some different offsite stuff, but we don't deal with that anymore. So we don't have to touch local stuff. Um, so those are really the main four parts. Uh, the, the first one, obviously being keyword research, we have to know what it is we're trying to do. Like, what are your goals? Where do you want to end up? If you know, you know, how many subscribers or how many customers you want to get on your platform or how many free trials and demos you want to do every week or how many SQLs you need to get per month. Um, we can take those those data points and we can do some reverse engineering, do some research and kind of analyze, all right, based on the search volume for a set of keywords and then the click through rate for the top three to five positions in Google. Uh, you know, if you were to rank in those positions, this is how much traffic per month you should be able to get with a conversion rate somewhere in the one to, to five to sometimes 8% range, depending on, depending on the industry, depending on the product and things like that. So we put all that data together and that helps us determine, all right, well, this, these keywords are really good because they will help you hit the goal that you want to achieve of X number of SQLs per month, for example. So once we figure that out, that's kind of like step one, that's the keyword research. Um, then we get into the technical audit side of things, which kind of runs a little asynchronously with our keyword research, which is just uh, analyzing the client, the client site, making sure that from a technical perspective, everything's humming along. You know, if it's on like Webflow, um, it tends to work really well, it tends to be really fast. I'm not, I'm not a, an advocate for them here publicly or anything. I don't make any money off of recommending them, but I will say I love Webflow, works really well. If you're on WordPress, also a really cool platform, but it tends to have more technical issues and we run into some things that are really common with WordPress. Um, luckily, WordPress has a major support base, so we can fix things really easily for that. Um, and there's HubSpot sites and other stuff like that, custom websites. So we go through those technical issues and we analyze what needs to be fixed in order to speed up the site, in order to make the user experience better, make the site more secure, kind of lock it down uh, and meet a lot of Google's expectations for what they want to see in a good quality website when they go to it, as, as well as what the user should see. So that's the technical portion. Then we get into the content strategy portion, which gets really deep. Um, and I, I know we don't have enough time to go into that too much today, but the idea is to take the pain points, you know, people Google their pain points, right? So like, if you're struggling with something, you're going to go Google that thing <laughs> that you're struggling with. So the keywords that we choose should represent the pain point that your target user is struggling with. Um, and then that tells us, okay, well, then we need to write content that helps provide the solution to that pain point. And sometimes that solution should just be free and in, in your content and you give them a strategy or you give them a tool or a free takeaway that they can go apply right away. And then in other cases, it really points to, uh, well, the solution is actually baked within our product here. And here's how you can use our product to solve that problem, um, which is a real basic and easy overview of general content strategy. Uh, it gets much deeper than that, of course, but that's kind of a, a touch on content strategy. Um, now, for us, in terms of practice, that applies to existing site content, but we also go into producing content, too, because I think every site needs to make sure they're consistently producing content so that you're addressing all the various pain points and kind of progressing progressing your site further into that space and into solving your, your target client's uh, problems, your target customer's problems. So that's kind of the content strategy side of things, and that's ongoing. Um, once we've nailed that down, then we move to the final piece of the four-part framework, which is really that link building phase. Um, and that's where now we've got some good content strategy set up. We've got some content processes in, in, in play where we're actually building and adding content to the site to address certain keywords. Now let's go try to build some links to some of those pieces of content to get that content to rank better. Um, and that goes very deep as well, very nuanced, and kind of looks a little bit more like modern day PR, um, digital PR, you know. Um, reaching out to various publications, pitching stories, 
Um, except there's a whole lot of uh, customization if you want to do it right. So for us being specialized with SaaS and only working with SaaS companies, um, we write all of the content that we get published on on the various publications. I, I would say like 90, 95% of the content that we get put out on various publications. And it's because we found that it's it's contextual relevance is key when it comes to getting quality links. And one difficult thing to do is to tell a publication to link to you and they just stick the link where they think it needs to go and it may not be in a relevant place and it may not work really well. And so if you can kind of control the, the dots, you know, and, and then connect them together. So the content on your site and the content on the publication and link those two together, um, that's how you tend to get the best, uh, the best bang for your buck. So that's pretty much sure, our, our strategy. Make sure I understand that just from the content point of view, you're, you're saying that the majority of the content you create for your customers, you're actually giving to third party websites in order to get the link back that you could place the link within the content that you create. So you're not necessarily publishing it on your, on your client's website. You're putting it on third party sites in order to get the link. Understand that right? for, the, for, for the link building side of it, yes. But okay. for the content strategy side of it, we're actually producing content directly for our client sites all the time. Um, most, of, most of our clients actually hire us to produce content for them. So content marketing for SaaS is like one big kind of thing that we, we find that a lot of folks are looking for. Um, they understand the importance of producing content. They understand that it will help them and they know and they see their competitors kind of dominating them. And so they you know, using content marketing. So they come to us typically either looking for SEO or for content marketing. Um, so if we're producing content for the client site, it has its own level of impact on their rankings. But if you want to throw fuel on the fire, you go build links to it as well. And we also produce content for that link building. So we're really, I mean, if you think about it, I guess we're kind of like a, a white glove service where that's concerned. We do it all from beginning to end. And the client can be pretty hands off if they want to be. Gotcha. Um, going back to what you were saying before about, about keywords and, and, and trying to create an estimate just from the beginning of, you know, based on the target goal of, of, of the SaaS company, how many, you know, SQLs, how many trials, et cetera, that they want to get, you can figure out, you know, well, which keywords do we want to go at? Um, I've heard of strategies in the past where before you kind of start optimizing for particular keywords, you go and buy those keywords with Google ads, for example. So you can actually know that before I invest, you know, thousands of dollars and, you know, months and months and months trying to get to the top of, of, of the SERPs for, for that particular keyword, you know, we can get there tomorrow, right? By paying for those keywords, you know, get a hundred, 200 clicks, see what our conversion rate is and find out if those are actually valuable from the beginning. Is, is that something that would be part of a strategy for determining keywords? Yeah, I like that actually a lot. I mean, one of the things that we kind of look for in the sales process when a new client's coming in is, have you done any advertising before? Have you run any ads? Because it, it would be good if you had, um, because you're probably then relying heavily on either some sales processes or some some ads or referrals to get you know customers on your platform. Um, SEO is one of those things you don't want to start necessarily day one at the level that we do SEO. Um, it's something that you kind of want to start once your business is a little bit more established. Um, you've got customers, but you're really looking to, to grow. You're looking to scale, you know, for, for a small SaaS startup trying to get to the $1 million mark annual revenue, I don't recommend investing in an SEO company like ours yet. Focus on just developing quality content that you're, you know, like blog articles if, for questions that you run into in the sales process, you know, so, or, or in your support documentation, if you keep getting the same kind of question, build a nice hefty blog article about that and that kind of thing. And that'll help you get some customers from a, from a beginning standpoint. But when you get to like closer to the 10 million annual recurring revenue and stuff like that, that's where investing in a larger SEO company to go in and do a full comprehensive approach is going to take you from, from that to 10 X that. So we, we see a lot of clients go to the, you know, nine figure range and, and above um, after investing with us. But I totally agree. I like, I like the approach of starting with a Google ads kind of angle to begin with, get some keywords in there, kind of understand what's going on with that. It can be a little bit of a catch 22 in that you do need content that you're pointing the keywords and the ads at, um, but you don't need a ton. It doesn't need to be what an SEO company would produce. It just needs to be a few good quality landing pages, a few good quality pieces of content you're trying to promote. Um, which actually in terms of promoting content, I can't recommend anything more than probably something like, like Facebook ads or LinkedIn ads. So. Okay, perfect. Um, so, so right now, what, what are the most effective, let's say low hanging fruit opportunities that a company can have? You know, most of our listeners are not going to be at that 10 million ARR point yet. Although sure. hopefully we've met many listeners are, and, 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 you know, you could be a good option for that, but you know, if, if at a lower stage, you're suggesting people should probably start with this in house, just some basic content, 
where do you see the best opportunities for people to, to grow and get that initial traction on, on SEO? Yeah. So I, I actually recommend something kind of like a, I, it's a loose term, kind of like a mothership keyword strategy. So the idea there is coming up with a keyword or a, a small family of keywords that I think best represent what your whole product is about, you know? Uh, and so for example, you might have like a gym, gym software, or gym management platform or something like that for managing gyms. Um, so for that, you wouldn't necessarily want to go crazy and just try to figure out all the keywords that you need to be targeting. Instead, it'd probably be a better idea to start with um, just a handful of them that are tightly relevant and then put together some sort of a guide, some sort of a large piece of content that answers a lot of questions that you know your product solves, but you also know that your target audience is struggling with. Um, and offer that guide up for free on your website. Uh, we, one thing we like to do is actually have the client publish the guide content directly on the site, kind of like a long, long blog article, um, but then offer a PDF download version of that too uh, for some lead nurturing purposes. And then when you people into your lead nurturing process, you can actually use email marketing, which is really cheap um, to get high quality versions coming from there. Um, so to me, that's one of those lower cost things that a founder or a, a small marketing team could do is kind of strategize a large single piece of content and really invest heavily in that one piece. Um, and then later on, as they're mentioning it around the web, maybe like product hunt and some other sites like that, they can get some, some free links pointing back to it and stuff like that, that actually helps it rank better and better. Uh, if you promote that on socials and stuff like that, you also stand the chance of getting some good links kind of organically flowing into those two. So let me make sure I understand that because that, that's, that seemed pretty interesting. So it sounds like kind of what you described as like, you know, one core, like, you know, pillar piece of content, right? That really just does your perfect explanation of, you know, the problem, your solution, the, the whole thing. I guess it's typically the type of thing that many companies would put into a lead magnet as a PDF and, and gate that content. And it sounds like what you're, exactly. what you're suggesting here is don't gate it. You know, just put it, right. you know, I guess first and foremost, totally searchable, but also that it becomes the, the core entry place that whether it's from SEO, whether it's from ads, you're sending traffic into that page first. Is, is that what I'm hearing? Exactly. Yeah. So it's funny because the gating content idea comes from the idea that you hold back something premium in order to capture a lead's details, a lead's data so that you can further market to them. And I love that angle. I love that idea. I'm a salesman at heart. So I totally understand having good quality data and indicators from someone saying, hey, I'm interested in your product. And then me being able to reach out to them and call them and email them and stuff like that. So I totally understand that. Don't want to get rid of it. Yep. But we take more of a hybrid approach to that. So people, believe it or not, still download the guide when it's sitting there right in front of them in a tab. And I think it has something to do with this. I, uh, I do it myself. I find myself downloading guides all the time when it's right there in a tab, I could just read it. I think it has to do with the fact that I close Chrome or I close Safari and I go about my business. But if I have some PDF document sitting on my desktop or on my iPad or whatever, I'm much more likely to be able to actually pick it up and read it whenever I want. I just finished uh, copy bloggers, got this uh, ebook they put together a while back and it's free and downloaded it on my iPad and I was sitting over there reading it. I, you know, that I think is how a lot of people are actually consuming content. And so what happens with that is by taking the, the valuable content out of that guide and putting it on a page on your site, Google can index that. Google can read that and see that. And if you've got like a 5,000 word count piece of content that's packed with value and you put a lot of work into it, you answer a bunch of pain points that your target customers are Googling, uh, it might show up for a lot of those keywords. And uh, so you start there, build a few links to that page, but make sure you've got good calls to action on there that are pushing the download capability for that guide as well. And you'll still be capturing leads. We do it all the time. That's really interesting. So, so would you think that the person who's going to read the content and then download the lead, because obviously you're, you're, you're going to capture less leads that way than if you gated it from yeah. the beginning, would you are going to get more yeah. people to actually consume the content, I would imagine, even though you're capturing less emails, I guess my question would be, from your experience, are, are the people who are downloading the PDF version, I'm, I would guess they're probably higher quality leads to begin with by the fact that they've read it, they've accessed it, and obviously, you know, this is really important, I really like this. Is there a higher exactly. quality in that lead that now comes onto your list? There is. And what's funny about it is we've noticed with some clients, they have this gated content and they're like, we've got like 20 guides and we've got 10 case studies and we got all these white papers and they're all gated, but we're not getting anything in our pipeline. And I'm like, all right, well, let's ungate all that content, let it rank organically, and you'll get slammed with your pipeline. Like you'd be shocked at how many people will start flowing into your pipeline. They're not getting anyone in their pipeline because 
the gated content's not ranking because it's hidden behind a gate and all the, there is is a landing page with a form. There's nothing for Google to hold on to to offer any of that up to, to users. And that content's not going to compete organically because it's a commercial looking landing page. It's not what the user is looking for. So we found that actually flipping it on its head, publishing the content directly on the site, now you're getting a ton of traffic. It's qualified traffic. And only, like you said, to your point, only the high quality folks are the ones who are actually filling out the form really and getting it down with the PDF. Yeah, and we make our forms a little intense too. So if you want to get the PDF, I'm asking like, how many people are at your company? Are you a SaaS company or not? Are you, you know, stuff like that. So by the time a lead fills out that form, I'm like, we're going to do business with them in a month or two. I can almost promise you. So, 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 that, so that's another interesting point. You know, typically when we think about a landing page for lead magnet, you know, the, the, the general you know, consensus is as few forms as possible so that you have, you know, the mm-hmm. highest conversion rate. But you're saying once you've yeah. kind of got the, this high intent, um, by the person who's, who's already at this point where they read the content, now they want a copy of it. You can ask a few more fields in there and get some more information out of them because we know they really, really want it at this stage. Exactly. And then what's cool to make it like one step, one step more fun, in my opinion, is that actually you've got the guide published on your site directly. Yep. You've got the call to action to download the guide, but that call to action, I think, should go to a landing page specifically meant for selling the guide, quote unquote, you know, like like promoting, just download the guide. You're going to get these chapters. It's going to tell you this. It's going to be good stuff. Fill out this form. Uh, now you take that landing page, come to somebody like you and say, hey, let's let's amplify this bad boy on Facebook and just get a bunch of, bunch of leads aimed at that. That's a match made in heaven, in my opinion. Now you've got one content asset that you put a lot of effort into uh, that, that only took your time. You really didn't have to pay anyone. If you know how to write about it, you could go hire an editor, have them edit it for you and clean it up. Get a few nice graphics and illustrations in it get that built get it put on your uh link to it in the main navigation on your site so that google can easily find it users can easily find it and i'll go promote that thing on facebook promote it on linkedin and get some ads pointing at it promote it on instagram get people downloading it and now you've got one asset that you've invested some time into that any ad dollar or any marketing dollar like link building and stuff like that that you want to do beyond that is all just going to compound on top of that one resource. And so I find that that's a really easy way for a smaller SaaS company who's got a, you know, a, a nice MVP and they've got maybe a million in annual revenue or, or even less, something like that. They can totally throw something like that together and go from 1 million to two to three by just creating this lead nurturing process and then, and then actually nurturing those leads, which is kind of that's outside the scope of this discussion, but that's that's the next big step is making sure that your lead nurturing sequence is solid. Right. I mean, being a you know a paid ad guy as my, myself in, in the SaaS world, I, I find this really interesting from a, from a funnel point of view and with with the content. So I guess what you're saying, just to make sure I'm clear, is you would you ungate the content and then you you point the ads at the ungated content. So it's essentially it's a blog post linked to from a prominent place on your, your head of your website or something like that. Um, and then you could do both. Well, you so let me make sure I understood what you said, because I was a little bit unclear the way you described it a moment ago. Got it. Yeah, it's so you can we've we've tested this a little bit, pointing ads at the guide uh, that's ungated and pointing ads at the landing page to download the guide. So think about it like this. So um, actually, I mean, if you want to go to our site, you can see the exact example of what I'm talking about here. We do it with our own guides, but basically imagine a blog article that's like a long form guide, or I guess a long form guide that's like a blog article. Yeah. You could read it right there in the tab, but there are all kinds of calls to action within the article to go download the actual PDF version of it. When you click one of those calls to action, it takes you to a separate landing page and that landing page has the form on it for putting in your info and also some details about the PDF you're about to get and why you should download it. Um, That landing page is what you would then promote on social um, that I find tends to work really well. So any kind of paid ads, you point them at that landing page Mm -hmm. tends to work really well because you can say in your ad text, I mean, you know better than I do when it comes to that kind of stuff, but you can say in the ad text, get a 60 page SaaS SEO guide for free, you know? And so someone who looks at that ad, they click on it, they're expecting to get a 60 page SaaS SEO guide for free. And yeah. so if the landing page is there and it sells them real well on it, they're, they're, they're likely to download it. While at the same time, one step before that landing page, the, the actual guide being published directly on the site, SEO is doing its thing, kicking users over to the landing page from that guide. So, uh-huh. so we've tested, tested running ads. Yeah, one ahead. landing page for kind of paid acquisition and one just for the, the search or organic benefit and then you're and you're sending exactly. people to it's interesting 
Um, and just so I'm clear, so if you've got a PDF on your site, you know, in a gated content point of view, Google is not indexing a PDF, even if it's hosted on your domain? If it's if the PDF is hosted on your domain and linked to from within the file structure and the link structure of the website, uh, Google can access it. But if it's if it's gated behind a form, Google's definitely not accessing it now. And even if, if you link to it from someplace else on the site, it's probably not going to be a very prominent link because you're usually going to link to the, the landing page instead. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I would recommend. I, we don't even let anybody download our guide until they go to the email that we sent them to click the link, which improves our sender score when it comes to lead nurturing, that uh -huh. all of that email gets opened and then clicked on. Um, and so that that actually improves your your relationship with the uh, the ESPs. All right, cool. That's uh, I didn't expect that was going to be a topic we were going to be focused on so much on, on this conversation, but uh, yeah, I find it really helpful. Hopefully yeah, others will also. Um, yeah. Take, taking a little bit of a shift away from kind of the, this core piece of content and lead magnets and such. Um, it's been a long time for myself personally since I've really focused on, on SEO. Uh, I think, as I mentioned in a previous conversation, you know, back around, you know, 2010 or so, I was doing some SEO stuff and kind of got slammed by, you know, Panda and Penguin algorithm changes and just kind of said, you know, the heck with all this, I'm done with SEO. I'm going to go heavy into paid ads from now on. And, and you know, that's all history. But Back in the day, you know, link building, you know, off-page SEO was kind of like the core thing that was really working. And I think there's been a bit of a shift from what I understand towards, towards on-page. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit of your thoughts. And, 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 and part of link building back then also was we were buying links and we got away with it and, and you know, life was simple and easy. Um, so so build, link building, you know, buying versus getting it organically through, you know, relationships that you've been describing and also kind of like the, this on-page versus off-page. You know, I'd, I'd love to have you explain a little bit of kind of what's, what's working these days. Yeah, absolutely. So if you, yeah, if you rewind to the very beginning of my career in SEO 2007, so yeah, 14 years ago, roughly. Uh, yeah, you could pretty much do anything and rank well in Google. Uh, it was real rudimentary algorithm. And then, yeah, some, they got really, really smart over time and just continued advancing it, making it more and more difficult. And uh, links were the dominant driving factor as a search engine ranking factor within Google for pretty much the, the main majority of its existence, of Google's existence. So the page rank algorithm was the driver of everything. And Panda and Penguin were elements of that. And you have all these others that have been elements of that as well. And Google's done a lot of other things to try to, to, try to look at that too as a, as a ranking factor and see how, how can they make it more nuanced. And, and the whole idea behind that is you can easily manipulate things on your existing website to fool the algorithm, right? You can load keywords up and you can do all this kind of, you know, spammy stuff, uh, black hat stuff, really. Uh, so what they said was, let's just develop an algorithm that looks at things that are much harder to actually influence, like links pointing into your site, votes from other reputable sites around the web. And so that's why links dominated the ranking algorithm uh, or ranking portion of the algorithm for so long. Um, it wasn't until I think it was when Sundar Pakai came in and took over, he kind of made this push for, well, everything's going AI. We're clearly using machine learning for what we're doing. Some of the data that we're able to pull in from Google Chrome and uh, looking at analytics data, looking at clickstream data and stuff like that, we're able to actually detect a lot more about uh, our users than ever before. And we're able to calculate and work with that data very, very quickly and personalize things in a big way. And personalization is really really important here, an important factor. So they decided to leverage that and start testing, um, you know, how, how are users engaging with the content that they're finding in Google? So you, you have a keyword you want to search. You got a problem you're dealing with, you go Google it. And as soon as you search it up, some results come up. First result, you click on it. And right away, this looks commercial back. I hit the back button. So that was a good bounce for them. Uh, the next page I go to, this looks a little better. I scroll down a little further, highlight some text, scroll a little further. I click another link. I'm like, yeah, this kind of looks like what I'm looking for. And I'm kind of drilling down further. I've been on here about a minute and a half now. Google is watching all of that. So <laughs> they see what you're doing and they're like, okay, they're really engaged on this page, the second page here. Uh, so is Google the Analytics code like tracking your behavior? Like how users are using I, that also? I, I'm not so sure about that. I, I wouldn't be surprised, uh, but I don't think, you know, I don't want to say that out outright as an SEO professional that I think that you need to have Google analytics code in order to do SEO. Well, okay. but I think, that, yeah, but I feel like why not? Why wouldn't they use that data? I mean, they've got it. Um, but Google Chrome is enough. I mean, it's the dominant browser. So 
why not just look look through Google Chrome and watch how people are interacting with it? You're completely in their world. Just like uh-huh. if you're on Facebook, you are in Facebook's world. They're Google looking Analytics everything. isn't doing it, but Chrome is doing it, as you're saying. Right. Yep. Okay. That's what I think. And then there's clickstream data too. So there are other you know, third-party data providers that are pulling in data from different platforms and stuff and selling that to Google too. And Google's processing that data. And of course, looking into compliance and security and privacy stuff and everything, trying to, you know, be above board, I think, to a degree. Um, but they're processing all of that on the back end at the very least to influence rankings. And so the biggest takeaway I want to have, you know, I want anyone listening to kind of take from this is that in the past couple of years, Google has made the shift for the number one ranking factor to not be so much geared by links, but by user engagement of content. Now, links are still extremely important. They're number two in line. So, uh, you know, out of hundreds of ranking factors, that's still like number two. So let's not get rid of that. But if your if your content doesn't engage the user and the user does not like scroll and click and really dwell on your site, dwell times a bigger term nowadays, um, it's it's going to hurt how well your site ranks in Google. And you can outrank major competitors on, you know, on certain keywords by having a, a high engagement on your content. And so I think it, you know, if, if you look at like YouTube's ranking algorithm and Facebook's ranking algorithm for stuff like that, engagement is what they're looking for. They want to see users be more engaged with their product and use them more and trust them more and spend more time there and that kind of thing. Instagram, another great example, like people liking stuff, people scrolling. When you stop and hover over an image, Facebook's watching that. You know, they know that you just stopped on an image even though you didn't make anything happen in your mind, right. something's watching and it's, it knows, Hey, that post probably has something to it. So that's something to think about when you're, when you're developing your site, make sure that it engages the user really well. And it sounds like you're saying that's the opportunity that you could actually beat out the big guys that you think are, are unstoppable. If there's a larger SaaS company already ranking through the term you want, don't, don't assume that you can't beat them. What you're saying is that you, you possibly can. Totally. And I will say though, if they've got like a 90 domain authority and you you're brand new on the scene, got no links, it's going to be tough. That's yeah. not going to work. You know, you've got to have something to compete on the first page, but once you get up onto the first page link links will get you from unranked to position 10 and, and below, or I, I should say above, I guess, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, you know, I- anything under position 10, so nine, eight, seven, first, first second. But, but once you get to the first page, uh, you pretty much need user engagement to beat out sites like Wikipedia and government sites, and then your dominant competitors and stuff like that. Uh-huh. So you're saying the, the link building will get you potentially to page one, bottom of page one, and then you're going to need to yeah. make sure that the user experience is, is top notch in order to move up the ranking. Yeah. And links will still get you up in the rankings on the first page, but there comes a time where if your link, link profile is comparable to a competitor, but they have better user engagement, they're going to win. Makes sense. All right. Um, awesome. I know I learned a ton here. Um, I probably got more questions. I'm gonna have to follow up with you also. And, and, uh, but let's, let's jump into our, our lightning round real quick. A couple quick questions, a couple quick answers and, and we'll wrap things up. Um, so first question I got for you is, um, what book would you recommend to, to listeners? It could be a business book or, or a non-business book. Mm, good question. One that I'm kind of devouring right now. And I love a lot. I think this applies really well in the SaaS space is hundred million dollar offers by Alex Hormozzi. Really cool book. Love it. Um, I, I, I think it applies to SaaS because he uses some really good sales salesmanship ideas that can easily fold into marketing and then can be used kind of like a growth hack. If you're, if you're trying to do that. All right, cool. Um, and what's your favorite marketing or productivity tool right now? Let's see. Productivity tool, I would definitely say is superhuman. That's my email app of choice. Yeah. I know it's like the, I know it's the Silicon Valley's kind of like diamond ring to a degree, but it's, um, it, I love it. I fly through it. It's, it's my, it's my productivity hack for sure. Amazing. Um, who's your favorite marketer or business leader you're learning from these days? Hmm. Good question. I'm actually, funny enough, I've been digging back into some of the old dudes again, going back through David o- Ogilvy and everything and looking yeah. at some of their copywriting chops and everything. Um, I'm kind of reading through some Dan Kennedy and um, uh, I'm kind of obsessing with really some of the, some of the old admin uh, because I feel, yeah, the classics, because I feel the copywriting stuff is just, it's not going anywhere, man. It's only, it's only, you know, better than I do that when, when it comes to copy, when it comes to copy, that works well from an SEO perspective as well as from an ad perspective. So I, I love it. I'm digging into that right now. Okay, great. And last question I got is uh, where can our listeners go to learn more about you? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, you can check us out, simpletiger.com. Um, you know, like I said, we only work with SaaS companies. I'd say 90% of them are B2B SaaS companies. And so if you're looking to scale free trials or demos, things like that, and you want to do it organically, you've been running ads for a while, you want to keep running ads, but you really want to to scale your growth, make it a little bit more automatic and, um, you know, see some good quality content on your site, get quality leads. Um, SEO will help you with that. So check us out, simpletiger.com. Okay, awesome. Jeremiah, thank you for joining us. It's been great. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.